thank you all very much for having me and my family. This church has been a, a dear blessing to me. This pastor means a, means a great deal to me. From the first time I come and visited, y'all treated me like family. I praise the Lord for that in this church. Uh, it's not like that everywhere. You, you're very blessed to have a church like this. Uh, I had a, a completely different message that, to tell you the truth, about, I don't know, probably, I believe two years ago, the Lord gave me a message that, that the whole time I, I preached it at, at our church, and, but the whole time I was putting it together, I thought, I'd like to preach that at Bear Trail. Y'all have so many young men in this church that are doing something for the Lord. It's sort of geared that way, and I kind of thought that's what I would be uh, preaching this evening, but the Lord led me in a different direction. And to tell you the truth, this is the very first sermon that I ever preached. It's been about three years since the, the first time I got to got to preach, and uh, this is the, the very first sermon that I ever preached. And uh, we're going what we're going to look at, the Apostle John, uh, throughout the gospel, he refers to himself as the the disciple whom Jesus loved, or that that phrase, or a variation of that th phrase throughout the book about five times, and uh, I believe it's significant, and because e every every word in the Bible is significant, uh, every word of God is pure. That means there's no admixture, there's no extra words, there's no words left out. Our Bible is complete and inerrant and infallible and uh, uh, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away so it's indestructible and I, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a great preacher but I've got a, a great book to preach out of. I've got a great Savior to preach about and uh, he gives us many examples of, of uh, of others, not just himself, but he gives us many examples of, of people in the Bible that we can follow after as long as they are following Christ. And I believe the Apostle John is one of these. And as we look at each of these passages, uh, I studied them out, I could see six characteristics about John that the uh, Lord apparently loved. And uh, uh, every time he made the phrase or said the phrase that he was the disciple whom whom Jesus loved, and I believe in picture form. Most of the time, it's a it's a physical picture of something John is doing. But I believe in in picture form. There's a spiritual application that we can make to each time the the phrase is made, and we can use that in practical living as Christians. So we're to to learn and to strive and to grow in in faith uh, toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And if we're we're just uh, taking it in and we're not doing nothing with it. We have deceived our own selves. So we, we need to put the word of God into effect. If not, it's, uh, it's of no use. And then uh, lastly, uh, we'll, we'll look at how John could know he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's going to be the, the, the conclusion. It's how John could, could know that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. So first turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. <clears throat> like I said, I'm not, not necessarily preaching the, the actual context. We're just using these as picture forms. So I'm not going to read a big, huge passage each time we look at these verses, but we'll just get a little bit of idea of what's going on. Here in John chapter 13 is when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And then he... He explained why he'd done so. And we'll pick up reading there uh, for just to get started. Uh, in John chapter 13, verse number 12. Uh, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what, what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that, that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So that's why Jesus 
washed the disciples' feet, and he explained to them. He said, this is an example. This is what you need to be doing. And uh, then Christ revealed that, that one of those very twelve would betray him. And now let's look at, uh, uh, skip down to verse number 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Verse number 23, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know from we know that John is speaking of himself, but the first point is we're going to look at where John was, John's position to Jesus. John's position to the rock is why, why Jesus loved John. When Judas had betrayed him, John would be the one that was leaning upon his breast. See, uh, unlike Judas, it would be most difficult to betray the one that you are leaning upon. But John was leaning upon the rock. And if you're going to betray what you're leaning upon, you're going to fall too. Uh, John wasn't willing to fall because he, did, he didn't want to betray his rock. He was leaning upon the rock. He was uh, where he should have been. And I would say leaning upon the rock is the very best place that any of us could lean. Uh, Psalm 62 two says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. That's a great position to be in, is to be uh, leaning upon the rock. How did, how did John get, get in this position? Uh, James 4.8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. You see, we can be as close to the Lord as we want to be. But the bad part is that is as close as we will ever be. It's up to us how close we want to be to the Lord. There is no limit to how close we can be to Jesus Christ if we desire Him, if we desire His Word. Hebrews 10.22 says this, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, as long as we are willingly and knowingly wallowing, wallowing around in sin, we are not going to be close to the Lord. You can't be dirty and be close to the Lord. You can be dirty and fake being close to the Lord, but you're not going to have a real relationship with the Lord if you are willingly living in sin. And if you want to be, if you want to be closer and nearer to the Lord, you'll want to be you'll want to be clean. You can't be around somebody as clean as the Lord is and be dirty. They go hand in hand. And there's a, a practical warning here comparing John and Judas. You see, the less space there is between the Savior and you, there's limited opportunity for the world to get in. Uh, so if you leave an opening between you and God, Satan's going to get in. Uh, uh, Genesis 3.1 and 2 Corinthians 11 Three tell us that that the devil, the serpent, he is subtle. He he doesn't uh, come at you wide open, but he's subtle. He's going to if you leave one crack open, he's going to get in it. Uh, Judas Iscariot did just that. He he allowed worldly greed to put him in hell. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil they all work hand in hand. Uh, to try to keep us away from the Lord. And if you, if you open yourself up to one, if you give in to the lust of the flesh, and uh, the world will seem more enticing to you, and then the devil is going to uh, wear you out. Uh, James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world, uh, friend, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And, and 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And Satan is the God of this world. When we open our heart to the world, you open it up to the devil. 
so the first point we're looking at is the position. We've got five more. Let's uh, let's just stop there and, and pray one more time and ask the Lord to help us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to get to uh, come before your people and open up your book and to, to preach your word. Lord, I pray you'll help me to be a blessing to your people. Help me to say everything that I ought to say and nothing I shouldn't. Lord, I pray you will uh, ease my nerves. Lord, just to... Uh, uh, Help your people through me, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So if we if John John knew that Jesus loved him because of his position to the rock. That's how that's one 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 way that John that's one reason, excuse me, that's one reason Jesus loved John is because how close he was to him. Uh Next is not necessarily the phrase. My nerves is zapped all the moisture in my mouth. <laughs> this up here, I just like I, you're talking about something that'll dry up a creek, <laughs> and then it pops out on your head. <laughs> That's where it goes. <laughs> Excuse me, but if I didn't if I didn't get nervous preaching this book, I would I would seriously think something was wrong. I, 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 like I said, I, I started preaching about three years ago, and it's not like every week or anything. And but I, I don't think I've ever preached and not been nervous more more here than than usual. But nonetheless, and so as we make our way to the next passage, which uh, uh, we'll get to in just a second, the next point I want to make is sort of in between times in John eighteen, uh, Judas. Uh, had had betrayed the Lord and they come to arrest the Lord. Uh, Judas and the, the Jewish leaders and the band of Roman soldiers, they come to arrest Jesus in the garden. And, and initially, John did flee, just like the rest of the apostles, because the scripture can't be broken. And in Zechariah uh, 13, 7 says, Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So John initially, initially run. But unlike the others, John gathered himself together and he went right back to his shepherd while while Peter sort of uh, uh, followed followed afar off he was outside he was half-heartedly hiding and he was contemplating even uh, denying that he even knew the Lord uh, and, and you know at one time the Bible says in Luke 10 that there were 70 disciples of Christ and and then by by something Jesus said, they were offended by Jesus' words. I believe Peter was a little offended by Jesus' words when he took out the sword and cut the high priest servant's ear off and uh, Jesus rebuked him. I believe Peter might have been a little uh, little offended at that also. But, but the majority of these disciples, when Jesus was talking about that you'd have to eat his flesh and drink his blood, they were offended by that and... Uh, and, and John uh, six sixty six, you know, the the verse says that there are many turned away and walked no more with the Lord. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that number's significant when you turn your back on the Lord. Uh, it don't, and it didn't say that they quit believing in Jesus. It said they walked no more with Him. Uh, but that that seventy dwindled down to twelve, and then we know the story of Judas. So it was really eleven, and then then there was the three. Uh, that, that had went to the garden with Jesus, Peter, James, and John, but now it's down to one. He has one of the of Jesus' closest companions. It's down to one. And this took real courage for John to, to remain present through this mockery of a trial that they put Christ through. And you know, that's what courage is. Courage isn't the lack of fear. Courage is, is facing danger. Uh, fear is a real thing and and we have to carry on in the presence of danger. We have to carry on while we fear. Uh, Psalm 56, 3 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's okay to, to, be, uh, to be of fear as long as you keep going for the Lord. Don't let fear stop you from following the Lord. These Jewish leaders had been trying to kill Jesus for for quite some time now, so John was very aware of the danger that he was in by being there. Uh, so what does that have to do with us? So you have to, uh, and I guess some of it may have settled down here and there, but 
with the the state of the country we live in. This is where we live. I'm not uh, down in our country, but we know that unless you have your head completely buried in the sand, that that Christians will be losing our freedoms. It, it seem it seems like that barring the rapture or revival, like the world has not seen, our our freedoms are slowly slipping away and we Christians are being more and more openly persecuted in, in this country. So we have to, we're going to have to decide now when it comes that we're going to stick with the Lord. Yeah. You, can't, you can't wait till it happens and then say, I'm going to stand up for the Lord. You have to be determined now. And I believe John was. The initial shock had John, uh, had, a bit, had him a bit afraid. But he turned right around and went back and he stood with his Lord while he was being uh, condemned, unrightly condemned. Uh, John 15, 18 says this, if the world, the Lord says this, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I have said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So the Lord plainly tells us that uh, he was persecuted. We are going to be persecuted. And it may not be, uh, it may not be death. It may be ridicule. If, uh, uh, the Bible considers ridicule, <laughs> as, as simple as it is, considers rib ridicule uh, persecution. Ishmael was said to have persecuted uh, his brother. And if you'll go back and look at the story, he laughed at him. That, that, was, that was the persecution. He made fun of him. Uh, but in, in the world we live in today, sometimes when you're getting made fun of, it's hard to stand. Uh, but that somebody making fun of you, we're going to get made fun of by somebody for doing something. It might as well be standing for the Lord. Uh, I mean, make it worth, worthwhile if you're going to be picked on. That, that's the only thing worth being picked on for. Uh, I mean, stand up for the Lord. Second Timothy uh, three twelve says, "Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." We're going to go through tough, tough times for serving Christ. But what are what are we going to do? Are we going to carry on, or are we going to run? So John carried on. His his love for Christ uh, kept him came right right there. You know and. And there was nothing at all John could have done in that trial. But I'll tell you, even when there's nothing in the world you can do for somebody, just being there means a lot. Uh, I mean, and in some, you don't have to say anything. Look at Job's friends. They were such a blessing until they opened their mouth. Sometimes we just need to be there for somebody. Uh, pat them on the back, give them a hug, and just be there. But uh, Jesus loved John because he... He persevered through peril. That was point number two. I don't even know if I said that. See, I'm not a great preacher. <laughs> I've, I've not taken a homiletics class. I took the school of hard knocks. So, <laughs> All right, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. <clears throat> Why was John the disciple whom Jesus loved? John chapter 19, verse number 25. <clears throat> now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into, took her unto his own home. John was a proven, trustworthy provider. Jesus, being the elder uh, son of Mary, and she apparently a widow now. We don't hear anything else about uh, Joseph. So Jesus was apparently the caretaker of Mary. It was his responsibility to. Uh, see for her well-being when he was gone and it was his final act of fulfilling the law uh, was to make sure his parent was was taken care of uh, actually first timothy 5 4 says if 
But if any widow have children or nephews, let them first learn to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Jesus practiced what he what he preached. You know, Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. Uh, so uh, Mary was certainly not a perpetual virgin, as the Roman church teaches. Either that or she was a sinner for withholding herself from her husband, either one. But but those six, at least six people, they could have cared for their own mother, but that's not who Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to. Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to John. John had proven himself worthy for the Lord to trust his mother's care and not just trust him to care for his mother, to become her son. And, and, and I mean, he was fully passing the, the responsibility just like he had the responsibility on to John. What greater privilege could Jesus have given a man on, on, on earth than to care for his, his mother? Uh, you know, this applies to, to us in a way that it's, it's a privilege, an absolute privilege for a sinful human being to get to do anything for a holy and righteous God. Uh, we 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 say you know we, you know we serve Christ, but I mean it ought to be uh, shouting ground when we get to do anything for God. Uh, he could have bypassed us. Uh, he could have brought. He, he could have written the gospel in the sky with the clouds. He didn't have to use human beings, but he decided to use human beings, and uh, it's a it's a privilege to get to do anything for us. See, he entrusted his mother to John, but you know. His word is here on earth and he entrusts us to care about his word and defend his word and to provide other people with his word. Uh, uh, you know, that's how people get saved is what, what they do with, the, with God's word. And we ought to be careful to, to provide others with his word just as John cared for Jesus' mother. See, if, if we want to do anything for Christ, we need to prove ourselves worthy first and then allow the Lord to put us in the position to use us if He desires to. We don't, this, I, I guess it works in some, some cases, the fake it till you make it, but you need to be what the Lord wants you to be and then let Him put you where He needs you to be uh, instead of you know trying to take on responsibility that you're not ready for, that you're, He hasn't prepared you for. Uh, just just to be everything that God will allow you to be and then let him use you. Uh, this uh, will of God that a lot of people uh, talk about it, some mysterious thing. And, and I do believe God has specific things for every person. We're going to touch on that later. But the will of God is plainly laid out in the Bible. It's things exactly he wants every Christian to do. And, and if, if we're doing those faithfully, God's going to use us somewhere. Uh, you know, Paul was counted faithful before the Lord put him in the ministry. Uh, Colossians 1 uh, verses 9 and 10 says this, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of of God. So John was a proven, trustworthy provider. All right, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Point number four. <clears throat> John chapter 20. Verse number one. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken the Lord, taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. See, the, the beloved John, throughout the gospel, he, he recorded, he seems to always have a way of letting others have the preeminence. 
he mentioned Mary Magdalene by name. He mentioned Peter by name and himself. He's the other disciple. That's, that's taking a lower position. Uh, you know, he, he never even mentions his own name in the gospel. And actually, he only refers to himself as I, uh, as far as I can tell, in the very end of the chapter. I think it's the very last verse of the chapter 21 25. Uh, let me just turn over and read that. Uh, and there are also many other things which Jesus did and which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Uh, amen. That's the only time I can find that John even refers to himself as I. So John has passed the preeminence on to other people. Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says, if there if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to put others first. You know, the old saying, how to have joy is Jesus, others, and then yourself. I believe you could also say Jesus overcoming yourself. Uh, if Jesus overcomes you, you're going to serve others and you're going to put others first. The, this world, once again, this world has a way of making us look inward all the time. My happiness, what I want, what I need uh, all the time. And that's not the way God would have us to do. He wants us to look out for others. Uh, Romans 12, 10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. See, uh, John's Holy Spirit inspired uh, gospel record. Uh, Je he presents Jesus Christ to us as the Son of God. He is, he is deity. And the disciple whom Jesus loved wanted to make sure that he didn't take any glory away from the Lord by pointing to himself. Uh, uh, unlike uh, Diotrephes, we read in, in 3 John uh, Third John 9 and 10 says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. What about that? Somebody in a church wouldn't receive one of Christ's very apostles. That's somebody wanting to have preeminence. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith, neither doth he himself received the brethren and forbidding them that would and casting them out of the church. God forbid that a man have the preeminence in a church over Jesus and over his word. God forbid. <clears throat> Colossians 1 verses 16 and 18 says this, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So we should give others preeminence and we should give Christ preeminence above and beyond all of them. That's how John was loved by Jesus because he passed the preeminence to others. John 21, John 21, number five. <clears throat> John 21, verse number seven. Now this is, like, like I said before, this is going to be a, a physical thing that we're going to take a spiritual application from. You know, the, the odd thing is, in every chapter, in every chapter of the book of the John, 
in the book of John, Jesus does just the opposite. He gives them a, a uh, he's talking about a spiritual thing and they mistake it as a, as a uh, physical thing. Uh, in John 21, verse number seven, uh, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. These, all these men, well, I don't know that all of them were on, on the boat fishing, but these men all had spent the majority of the last three and a half years with the Lord. They had heard him speak, as we heard this morning, that he had lifted up his voice when he preached. He preached from a, a sea, seaside ship pulpit. And they was all there. He had spoken in the synagogue. He had taught in the temple. And he had taught them uh, face to face. They all should have been accustomed to his mannerisms, his gestures, because they had spent day and night with him for the, for the most part for three and a half years. But now with just a, a little bit of time away from Jesus' resurrection, you know, he don't spend every day with them. He just shows up and... Uh, from time to time, it seems, I don't know how much time he actually spent with them after his resurrection. I know he, was, he walked the earth for 40 days, but now with a little bit of time away and uh, a little bit of distance, physical distance between themselves and the Lamb of God, they couldn't recognize Christ. Uh, but John did. John recognized Christ. The one that had made the effort to be as close to the Lord as he could. Uh, he had spent as much time near the Lord for as long as he could. And now, looking from the sea to the shore, he was the one that could identify the Savior. You know, every second that we spend with Jesus Christ is time well spent. And it's going to pay off in treasures untold. Uh, you know, when you, when you love somebody, you're going to get to know them. You're going to have a keen eye for them from a long way off. You know, the, the prodigal's father, uh, when he was coming on, it says, the Bible says when he was a long ways off, he saw him and he ran to him. You know, when there's somebody you love, you're going to have a keen eye for them. Uh, Friday, when I was looking for Beth and the boys there at, at Carowinds, they was a long ways off. Uh, uh, Miss Hallie pointed me in the right direction. I couldn't, uh, I'd called Beth and couldn't get her to answer, but I stood at the gate and it didn't take long till I seen my wife and my boys. I had a keen eye for them. There's a lot of people there, but it didn't take long for my eyes to, because I, I know her, I know them. I have a keen eye for them. John had a keen eye for the Lord and a, a long ways off. The way we get to know the Lord is how much time we spend with Him. How much time do you spend getting to know Jesus? Uh, how close would he have to be before we would recognize him? Uh, how much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you spend in church, listening to preaching, uh, in fellowship with others, talking about the Lord, about the things of God, but most importantly, how much time do you spend in this King James Bible? That's, that is where we really, really get to know the Lord, the Lord that saves us, the Lord that's going to judge every man is right here in the in the pages of Scripture. John John got to spend physical time with him, and he knew him. But we can we can know the Lord by spending time in His Word. Uh, John five thirty nine says, "Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of Me." We want to know the Lord. We got to know His Word. Luke 24, 27 says, and begin, this is Jesus speaking, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And uh, 24, 44 of Luke also, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So if we want to know the Lord, if we want to have a properly trained perception of the Lord, point number five, we need to know Him by His Word. <clears throat> point number six, I think this is number six. 
John 21 20. John 21 20. <clears throat> then Peter, turning about, seeth a disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter say, seeth, Peter seeing him, saith to him, Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Verse 20 was our verse. The, the, uh, the one, Peter turning about and saith the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Uh, point number six, we, John has a pursuit toward the prince of life. This, this pursuit that John has, it's voluntary and it is personal. John took it upon himself to keep following the Lord. Uh, Peter was asked to follow the Lord, and there's nothing wrong. Peter did follow the Lord, but he had to be asked. John didn't have to be asked. He didn't have to be prodded. Where the Lord was going, John voluntarily followed after him. <clears throat> John was content, content to do whatever and go wherever uh, the Lord wanted him to do and to not be distracted by what others were doing. Peter was concerned about John, but when John asked about, or when Peter asked about John, John didn't, it don't say that John even reacted. He didn't care what Peter thought about what he was doing. He was following the Lord. Uh, you know, we need to not be distracted by what others are doing, good or bad, uh, like John was. He set his affections toward Christ and he kept them there. <clears throat> Jesus, told, Jesus told Peter not to concern himself with his plans for John. Uh, you know, he, he said if, if he tarry, uh, verse number 22, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. He, he kind of rebukes Peter for the same thing uh, that John was doing. He said, it doesn't matter what John's doing, you follow me. John was following him. <clears throat> and that's what we need to do. We don't need to let... Uh, God, God might use somebody in a great way and we'll get our eyes set on them. Why don't it use me like that? That's just as much of a distraction as the world tearing you out and pulling you away from the Lord. We have to focus on us. Whatever ability God gives us, use it to His glory and not worry about what anybody else does. We're going to be, we're going to have to answer for ourselves and our opportunities, what the Lord has given us. We're we're stewards of what he's given us. We're not stewards of anybody else's stuff. He, he gives us certain things to, to do and to take care of, and uh, that's, uh, that's what he wants us to do. The Lord does have a specific plan and a personal plan for each and every person, and he deals with each person individually, but he also warns us not to meddle in God's plan for everybody else. Uh, you know, I don't know what the Lord has planned for for even my children, but I want to guide them as much as I can. But if if God has plans for them to to do something big, that's great. I just want them to be obedient to the Lord. I want to do what I can to allow that. That and I believe that's all I can do. Uh, you know, there's people have so uh, so much worldly expectation or desires for their children. I it wouldn't bother me a bit if my if my, my boys have a hard-working job and follow the Lord, it wouldn't bother me if they never go to college as long as they, they know the Lord and they're living for Him. I, 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 other than they, if they take care, you know, if they, if they follow the Lord, they're going to take care of their family. They're going to do all those meaningful things. I, they don't have to be rich to be rich in God's eyes. And, and I'm, uh, as, a, as a preacher, but as a Christian, that's what I want for my children. I, uh, if they if they both end up being missionaries, I'd shout the house down. I, I would love it if they could serve the Lord. And I don't know what God's going to do with them, but I want to afford as many opportunities as I can without meddling in God's plan for their lives. But, uh, you know, this pursuit John had to follow Christ has awarded him with certain opportunities. Uh, personally, I, I believe including under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to pen five books of the Bible. Uh, and then uh, of all, he got to 
he got to record the revelation of Jesus Christ. I, I think that was a reward for his obedience in following the Lord. He was he was obedient. He was the most loving. I believe he was the closest human being to the Lord, and he got uh, he got a, a earthly reward that still had heavenly reward to it at the same time. He got to see the coming king before he can he's already seen it and we we have yet to see it but we will get to see it but but john got to record that when nobody else did i believe that was a reward he got for his uh, faithfulness to the lord he outlived all the other, other apostles and he was the only one to die a natural death according to the history so john personally went after christ wholeheartedly and he was greatly rewarded and Christ will do the same thing for us if we will go after him wholeheartedly. He will greatly reward us with rewards that are literally out of this world. Yeah. All right, in conclusion, how did John know that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved? He knew that because personally he knew that he was an unworthy, condemned, hell-deserving sinner that the Lord Jesus Christ saved by grace. John could only speak for himself. Uh, just like I can only speak for myself, and just like each and every one of you, you can only speak for yourself. It, it's been said and proven true that you can't argue with a personal testimony. And, and I believe that's what, what this is. See, you're either, you're either saved or lost, and you and God are the only ones that really know that. And John was simply sharing his personal testimony of Jesus' grace and his love and his mercy every time that he described himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Can you say that this evening? Can you say for sure that you know you are the one that, that Jesus loved? You can't be saved by proxy. Uh, you, you can't be saved by being born into a Christian home. You can't be saved by uh, going to church all the time or even being baptized. We know that don't save. You, you're not even saved by knowing and believing who Jesus is. You have to be saved by having a, a personal acknowledgement that you are a lost sinner in need of the Savior and you fully trust the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. John knew that. That's how John could personally say he knows that he is the one whom Jesus loved. I know that Jesus loves me. And John knew that Jesus loved him. Do you know for sure without a shadow of doubt this evening that that Jesus loves you. John 3.16 says, that For God so loved the world that you need to know personally that God loved you and He died for you. Uh, we'll finish with, uh, with, with the, the plainest uh, deliverance of the gospel uh, because you must receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Jesus Christ is the the Savior of the world, but He saves each individual one soul at a time. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You have to believe it personally and if you do believe it personally, you will know that you are one whom Jesus loves. And as Christians, we can. Uh, Jesus will, will love us and grow closer to us if we will uh, have a close position to the rock, will persevere through peril, if we'll prove, our, prove ourselves trustworthy, if we'll pass the preeminence to Him and others, and we need to have a properly trained perception. We, have to know, we need to know the Bible so we can identify the real Christ so we're not deceived. And we, have, we need to have a pursuit of the Prince of Life. We need to follow hard after God. John was a disciple whom Jesus loved, but I'm a disciple whom Jesus loved. Are you this evening a disciple whom Jesus loved? Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to 
stand before your people and preach. Lord, I pray uh, that I've been a help. help that, I pray that it's been a blessing to somebody. Lord, if there's anybody here this evening that has not trusted you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that uh, today would be the day of salvation. Lord, don't let anything hinder them from, from moving from where they're at and coming and getting saved so they might know you. They will know personally how much you love them. Lord, help us to live each and every day uh, pleasing to you. Lord, put a desire in our heart to do nothing but please you. Lord, I pray for those being baptized today that this first step of obedience in following you will lead to a life of service for you. Uh, Lord, I just uh, thank you for this church and this opportunity. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.